Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the, uh, the last panel of the day, I believe. So hopefully we can all make it through this one together. Um, this panel is all about new revenue models. So hopefully we're going to have an exciting discussion about new ways to make money. And uh, we've got an excellent lineup here. We've got five panelists uh, representing five different companies uh, across the board from Canada, uh, Arizona, the UK. Um, it's pretty international, so hopefully we can get, get into that a little bit as well. Um, but without further ado, uh, I'll just do a brief introdu introduction and then uh, ask the panelists to also introduce themselves and talk a little bit uh, about what they do. So uh, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Nico Perez. I'm co-founder of Mixcloud. Uh, it's an internet radio platform. Uh, we host radio shows and long-form audio uh, and uh, have a creative community on there. Um, would you like to uh, be first, Mark? Yes, uh, I'm Mark Greenberg from Traysona. We specialize in uh, derivative works licensing for uh, hard to reach markets, uh, like custom arrangement licensing, uh, adaptive rights licensing for uh, dance and cheer, uh, like Chantal, and uh, nuisance licensing for synchronization rights, uh, DVDs and downloads and streaming for ensemble-based markets. Hi, uh, my name is Chantal Epp, and I am the founder of Click and Clear. We're the world's first and only music licensing platform that really caters for sports that mix music illegally. So we're catering for what we call performing sports, like gymnastics, acrobatics, figure skating, cheerleading, dance, and so on and so forth, and providing them with a licensing solution so that they can instantly license music for use in their music mixes to accompany their routines at competition. And what they do is they um, kind of hire music producers to edit and adapt music into a mix specifically for their team. And uh, historically, it has always been done illegally until Sony Records sued someone. <laughs> so we're kind of here to, to create that solution and, and make sure that everyone is, is, is getting rightfully paid. Hi, I'm Nick McLeod from uh, Lyric Find. We uh, power the back-end lyrics for uh, all digital music companies, so we provide them with the lyrics and the licenses to use the lyrics. Uh, we have licenses from over 4,000 publishers. Uh, we manage those rights across 240 territories. We track the usage and then pay out to the rights holders um, for those uses. Uh, Deborah Evans, I'm here representing TrackLib, which is a Swedish company. Uh, not Arizona. I'm here via New Orleans. <laughs> we partner with DMG Clearances, a sample clearance agency here in the U.S. based in Delaware, uh, to offer sampled, uh, fully cleared 100% master and publishing uh, cleared samples, um, tracks available for sampling um, that can then be turned around and fully licensed um, at fixed prices uh, and then a revenue share model to put into your new song and then release very quickly and conveniently. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Paul DeGoyer, head of music for Peloton Interactive, uh, a hardware software platform for boutique fitness uh, in your home. We're uh, live casting about 12 hours of fitness content a day. Uh, right now it's spinning, bike stuff. Uh, in the fall will be treadmill and boot camp. Uh, and it's wall-to-wall -wall music, live and on demand. Good stuff. Good to hear. We have another country represented as well there. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get Doug straight in. Um, we've talked. You've heard a little bit about kind of the macro picture of what the companies do, but when uh, you're here in a, a room full of indie publishers, can you describe a little bit more individually about what opportunities your business represents for them in terms of a new revenue model? So, uh, you know, w one, of the, one of the rights that we specialize in uh, are for ensembles that create uh, their own sheet music. So anytime you see an ensemble, whether it's a, a marching band or a symphony orchestra, a show choir, uh, where they're performing the music, at some point in time, uh, somebody had to make sheet music for, that's tailored to that specific ensemble. So. You know, whether you see an orchestra playing a night of Queen, or whether it's a marching band playing a unique combination of songs, uh, there's a pretty high likelihood that uh, that arrangement was made custom, uh, that the people that 
print sheet music, uh, you know, they, that's not a stock arrangement that you can buy off the shelf. So there is a print right involved in all of that, and we collect on that print right um, and encourage people to pay their licensing. So uh, also, uh, you know, uh, there's manipulations of sound recordings and the publishing underlying the sound recordings for things like dance and cheer, and uh, th those are you know vast markets where. Um, they're hard to reach markets, but they're not being monetized properly and the music is more or less being stolen uh, from the rights holders. And so uh, those are the types of problems that Tresona solves with our technology. Um, you know, we are a, a technology company uh, first and foremost that makes it easy for people to obtain the licensing and then it's easy for the rights holders to administer their catalogs through Tresona. Um, approve the use or deny the use or approve the use with restrictions. And so uh, those are the type of things that we do. So. Yeah, I think going on from what Mark said, we're kind of concentrating on those hard to reach markets. And for us, we're really able to do that because of our experience as a company. So my background is in both music licensing, having worked at a company called Q Songs, which was a pre-cleared licensing platform. But also I'm a world champion cheerleader who owns a music production company catering for music mixes for cheerleading and dance. So we totally understand the rights that are actually required, which means when we're talking to publishers and labels, we can present to you exactly the grant of rights that we need so that that, that, that market is being catered for. Um, and it's not necessarily something you're gonna be aware of. You know, you've never heard of licensing for cheerleading or gymnastics or anything. You've never had to deal with it before. Um, but it's a really, really big market. And, and to give you just an idea of, of scalability, uh, in just the US cheerleading market, they require over a million licenses a year. And no one's got the time to do that on an approval basis. So. Good stuff. Yeah, so we launched uh, Lyric Merch last year, which is an on-demand um, custom merchandise service. Um, it's a website where fans can go and choose a specific song and then a line from that song and place it on a t-shirt or sweatshirt um, where they want it the font, the color, um, essentially like giving you a way to merch your entire catalog and then giving the fan the ability to choose and giving them the creativity and flexibility to create um, a one of one design that they want. Um, and then <coughs> it's you'll receive higher margins than traditional merch deals where you would have one design and you would see somewhere like a dollar per product. Um, you'll see somewhere like 250 per t-shirt and we're able to do that by eliminating the approvals. So we have strict limitations. They can only use the lyrics. There's no images or likeness or anything like that. Um, and then, <coughs> sorry. And then uh, we also remove the middleman. So we take care of all the manufacturing, the shipping, the website support, all of that. Um, and then you can increase your revenue by becoming an affiliate if uh, your artist links uh, their product on their socials or websites or uh, fan emails, then they'll earn an additional royalty for each sale. And then we also have uh, a design team in-house that you can work with to come up with uh, custom designs if you want to plan something around a certain release or a single or whatnot. Um, and so all we need is the rights and then to know what's in your catalog and then your stuff will be available on the site. It's uh, lyricmerch.com, and you can check it out. Good stuff. Deborah? Hi. Um, as last minute as it was for me to be here, I'm representing the company, which is based in Sweden. And um, because I work with Deborah Manis Gardner, who clears samples, uh, they partner with the company in Sweden to help consult on fees, rates, and setting up the company from a publishing perspective. And I think I was brought in, I know I was brought in to give some advice on, on those types of things. And so I'm, I'm kind of doubly here, um, thrilled to be here because you, you people are people that I know. I was at a, that uh, Las Vegas tech convention, which is probably the opposite end of the spectrum, spectrum uh, back in January. But here, um, I, I'm glad to be here because I can speak um, about publishing and um, help bring it into something that's very techy for me. So, um, and I, I understand what this company is doing, and I'm not a tech person, and I really like what this company is doing. 
Um, I'm, I'm just a bit of an advisor on PRO rights and registrations and contracts and things um, and fitting it all together. And I've looked at the way this company is intaking the, um, the music, doing the contracts, their pricing, and from what I've known, been known from working in the sample business with Deborah for years and just in licensing in through my publishing background, it's a very fair uh, way of getting the music out, and it's very fair to the publishers and it's fair to the labels. And I'm really glad to be up here representing a company that's that many of you all are going to have a lot of questions for me <laughs> uh, because it's a it's a techie company that's you know is playing with rights a little bit and might not know what all those rights um, uh, entail. But I think. This company does a pretty good job, so I just want to say that. Um, we just, our, um, our business is going to, because it's master and publishing, we only take the masters and publishing. It's, it's going to get music out there for sampled music. This is not beats or it, it's uh, older music, B-sides and things that have not been played that often. A lot of 70s we've already got, we launched in April, and we've, we've already got a lot of tracks up, um, some wonderful old old music that just hasn't been listened to and it hasn't been heard and can be sampled very easily. Um, you can cut and chop how, how you wish and there's a whole scale um, fee structure and put it into your new song and it's great music so it does open up catalogs and that's the main advantage of um, Good stuff. to you. Thank you. Uh, picking up on the uh, approval basis clearance doesn't work. Um, Peloton uh, programs their music uh, based on 12 fitness instructors that oftentimes roll into class with, uh, with a playlist that's kind of half-baked and want to go on in 15 minutes. So what we've had to do is build a library from song one um, and transition from this kind of Wild West thing that they were doing. And um, I'm excited to be here today because the, the way that we want to approach this from the publishing side is, um, I think, something that hopefully uh, all of you will find interesting in that, um, as opposed to major publishers that may not uh, be the best stewards of their rights profiles, they just toss a bunch of rights at us and fair enough. Um, we have a very straightforward blanket licensing arrangement and would love to enter into deals with um, any and all of you guys uh, where you can actually do a deal with us and have all your artists on restriction and your writers on restriction then go through and add them into a schedule or even give us individual copyrights. Um, we are trying to build a library of the most music that's appropriate for what we do. Um, we're building a system on top of that where new releases, uh, new music can be highlighted, alternate versions can be highlighted, but we're very much kind of knitting the parachute after jumping out of the plane. Um, we're fortunate that our, um, our uh, product has been successful, <laughs> um, but we're moving as quickly as we can, so pleased to be here today. I like that image, <laughs> knitting a parachute slowly. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, if anybody's looking for a seat, we have some seats right here in the front row if anybody wants to sit down. But uh, Moving on to the next question, it's a, it's a little bit of a philosophical question. I'm um, going to open this to all the panel, anybody who wants to chime, chime in. When you think about what your company is doing or what you individually are doing, why do you think nobody has done what you're doing before? Um, for us, it's really um, either the music industry just wasn't aware of it before or thought that it was too small of a market. I know everyone I've spoken to, they're like, why has never, no one ever done this before? And I'm literally, that is the question I get asked all the time. Um, and everyone in the music industry is, is really supportive and says, well, this is really, really interesting. And, I remember a conversation I had with one of the guys at Warner Chapel, and he was, we were talking about the whole click and clear model and, and getting them to sign up. And uh, he was saying how, you know, he's like, oh, I've, you know, I went to a cheerleading competition, I was watching my niece, and you know what? Yeah, they're using all of our music, and they've never licensed that before, because I would know. Um, and, and so it just kind of highlighted that to him, like, well, you just didn't think anything of it, because you didn't realize how big that, that market actually is. And, as we've developed into the kind of digital age, you know, we now have the technologies in order to create these licensing platforms where everything can also essentially be done automatically. You know, those teams can go on and search for the music that they want to use and then literally click and clear it. 
So it's, it's really, um, for us, it's that, that's the reason why it's never been done before. We're kind of bringing in the experience on both sides um, and, and making people aware that it is actually a really, really big market. Uh, I think that uh, one of the reasons, uh, and I, I see Helene Blue in the back there, um, why no one did this before uh, or concentrated on this before Traysona was that, you know, there, there are two issues. One is you have to obtain the rights, and if you come into the marketplace like Traysona did uh, like 10 years ago and you're a new company, um, unless you have someone like Helene Blue, who was instrumental in guiding Traysona and helping us, uh, introducing us to publishers and understanding what we tried to do. It's very hard because you, you go into a publisher and you say, look, I, I, I want to have rights to be able to issue these licenses and you know, you're going to get paid $125 if I issue the license. And then the publisher uh, probably has to say, well, you know, what happens if this company is a fly-by-night company and they don't pay me. What happens if this company issues a license and the writer gets really ticked off and yanks his catalog from me? So, you know, these are things that, you know, when we were approaching publishers, we really probably didn't even understand this 10 years ago. And without somebody like Helene Blue explaining to us, okay, well, you know, this, this is what the publisher is going to want and these are their concerns because, um, as Michael Ames told me once, I, I got into a fight with Michael Ames when I met him because I asked for a license and he told me no. And I said, what do you mean no? Because I, you know, I, I didn't know that you, know, you could say no. And I wanted a license for the Auburn marching band. And so uh, Michael Ames said, look, I, I just got the catalog and uh, let me call. And he called me back and he said, yeah, no, it's on hold for a trailer for a release of a Sherlock Holmes film. And so I said, well, you know, we'll put it on the Jumbotron. We'll put that trailer in Auburn Stadium when there's 80,000 people in. And he said, you know, what is it with you in, you know, getting this license? I'm like, ah, you know, I just don't want to disappoint anybody. And, uh, he finally said no, and I was you know, su <laughs> super obnoxious to him. And uh, I turned around and I, uh, you know, I, I called Ed Arrow, who was like the only other guy I knew besides uh, uh, Helene Blue, and Ed Arrow said, if you screw up a guy's trailer for a $130 license, you'll be a pariah and you'll never work in the industry again, which I, I took it to mean it was probably not a good idea that I keep pursuing this with Michael. But, you know, there are things that you just don't know when you come into the business. And then there's also, a, you know, for, for Traysona, it's a massive technological, a, a massive investment in the technology to be hooked into every publisher, to be able to restrict the way the content is used, and to be able to have the, the, the publishers, it, you know, say, look, uh, it's, it can't be used in a medley if it's, you know, these two writers hate each other. Um, if it's used, you know, in a medley, my song's got to go first. They got to be facing east when they play it. I mean, <laughs> like we have that ability to restrict things, you know, by writer, by usage, and it's not uh, an inexpensive endeavor. We have 21 people in our technology department and five people who handle the music licensing. So I think that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, people don't get into, or, 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 or these markets have been left alone for a long time because they're hard to reach and it requires a lot of capital to get there. So, Deborah, yeah. I think for Tracklib, um, this is the, the second kind of generation of sampling and no, n you cannot pirate, a, you can't sample without paying for it anymore and put out a major release, you just can't. Um, convenience um, beats piracy and that's actually one of the phrases on our on our presentation on the website, Tracklist website, which I encourage you to go through and see how simple it is to understand. Um, it's, it's very convenient to go through and license something that is 100% already pre-cleared. Um, and this has not been done before. And uh, particularly sampling is now such a, a mainstay of music. Um, and now we're also paying homage to uh, prior sample writers, prior rap 
rappers and hip hop artists. It's kind of coming back. We're sampling, you know, 90s as as we know. So um, it's um, it's a mainstay of our music now uh, that we include samples. Um, and so it just was necessary to have uh, a machine in place to offer this easy and it, it easy prices. The world of sampling, the world of sampling is very cloudy, and have, having worked in it for several years now, um, it's you know a lawyer calls and somebody can't they can't pay the lawyer to do this. They, the lawyer doesn't necessarily know how to clear a sample or who to go to. DMG doesn't you know we know who to go to but it's still our fees. This is a, a way to do it if you only have a li limited funds. Uh, you can get a sample legitimately and release your record within 24 hours. Out, out of curiosity, just quickly on the sampling point, and we're gonna talk about education a little bit later, but do you feel like uh, within the music world, more and more people are becoming educated about samples and learning about how to clear? Yes, I yes, definitely. Um, the lawsuits are always, and you know, <laughs> make people aware of um, what not to do. Um, but also, people listen. I think people hear music in there too, and go, "Oh, what's that?" and mm. and um, say, "Well, why don't I add something to my music to mm. make it a little yeah. more interesting?" Paul, did you want to chime in as well? Yeah, I was going to say in the case of. Uh, Peloton, it's an interesting question because I haven't actually thought of it this way, but it's, uh, there, there just hasn't been um, the specific combination of insane people in one place before, before Peloton. Um, the company started, uh, a serial entrepreneur called John Foley had kids about five years ago and realized he couldn't go to his boutique spin class and said, we, wouldn't it be great if we could just do this at home? Assuming that he could OEM the hardware, the bike, and just kind of set up a streaming platform, he started into that. They didn't find an OEM bike that they thought was good enough. Mm -hmm. So not knowing what they didn't know, they're like, oh, we'll just make one. Started to design one, designed a tablet, designed a metrics platform, and it was the entire time, the, fit, the traditional fitness industry was saying, you can't do that, it's not gonna work. And they were just nuts. They were like, we're gonna make it work. And, and so that kind of um, insanity basically powered them through to the point where they completed this project. And uh, all the way along, music was called out affirmatively as critical, having that same fitness class experience you'd have at a, you know, NYC sports club or a, a Soul Cycle, and having that in your home. And there again, they didn't know what they didn't know, um, but the kind of, just powered through it and to the point where I got involved with them in 2015 to try to figure out what they actually needed to do. Mm -hmm. And one of my conditions was, you know, if you're serious about this, it's gonna be expensive. As Mark was saying, you have to build, you're gonna have to build a platform to be able to account for these rights. You're gonna have to build a platform to drive a library with all sorts of flags for what people have opted into, the types of licenses they've opted into. And they were like, great. So uh, that's what we're doing, and you know, it's it's good working with crazy people. I don't know if you <laughs> you enjoy it. Yeah, I enjoy it actually. Yeah, being perfectly normal myself. Great. <laughs> Alrighty then. So um, zooming out for a moment and looking at kind of the the wider ecosystem and kind of what's going on this year. Obviously, a big topic is the Music Modernization Act. Uh, I believe it, it's now been passed by one portion of the House and had an incredible amount of support. Um, when we think about that as a backdrop of what's going on in the publishing landscape, how do you think the act is gonna affect either your business or the wider ecosystem as a whole? Anyone wanna jump in? Uh, so, I mean, Traysona, you know, we're members of the AMP, we're members of the NMPA. Um, it's a little bit above my pay grade, uh, you know, the, the Music Modernization Act, other than to say, you know, any time that the songwriters have an opportunity to be paid more money, um, if that's the end result, then we are completely uh, for it, um, you know, we, we want to see the songwriters get paid. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a UK-based company, but our, the majority of our market is actually in the US. 
um, and of course around the world. And so we've been following the um, the act to kind of you know because we think it's going to in some way affect us. Um, being a, a licensing platform, you know, we also deal with mechanical rights, or that is a part of what needs to be licensed, whether or not it's licensed to us. Um, and, and so we do have to be aware of it, but it does sound like a really great uh, opportunity for songwriters to be rightfully paid and, and you know, very much along in the same ethos of us where we, we want to support the artists and the music industry to ensure that the right people are getting paid for their works. I, I think the central database is going to be hugely yeah. important to just about everybody and anybody who's a, a licensing company um, wanting to go uh, and uh, get find rights holders. So we're, we're going to like that a lot as, as this company. And also the, the classics part of the uh, MMA is going to help us too because that's going to revive all the, the older recordings, I believe, so you know, th because they're going to be getting paid for digital. So that's going to help some of these older recordings that we're putting into our uh, database and um, it putting the metadata into that people are going to search for and they're going to find these older tracks and they're going to get more radio play and therefore more money. Great. So um, coming back to the topic of education for a moment, you know, we spoke earlier about whether or not people are becoming more educated about sampling. Do you guys on the panel, do you think that consumers should be more educated about licensing and, and copyright in general? And if yes, how do you think we should go about that? Yeah, 100%. Uh, um, the whole reason why the cheerleading, dance, and other performing sports haven't been licensing music is because they didn't know how. Mm -hmm. And there was no way for them to actually license that music. And a big part of what we do is education. We're running a webinar in next weekend. Um, and we run quite a few webinars for those industries to teach them about music licensing. We provide them with the tools and utensils that they need so that they understand that licensing music is a thing that they need to do. And essentially, the music industry is a licensing business. So we make money out of licensing in whatever shape or form it is. You know, Whether you're selling music for a digital download on iTunes, that's essentially a license to say that this person can play the music at home. And, and so it's really about educating everybody because we are all consumers of music and, and music licensing does play a part of all of that in our lives. And I think as the music industry, we should really find ways in which we can educate um, those end users about how they license music and whether or not there are platforms that exist where they can actually go ahead and do it. Um, and you know the whole educating them about the restrictions, restricted artists as well. You know we've we're unable to license Justin Timberlake and Christina Aguilera because they just said absolutely no way. We don't want people editing and adapting our music. But you know the end users aren't going to be happy with that, and it's making them aware that the artists have their own rights, and they it's their choice if they want to license their music out. And if someone says no <laughs> to you, you have to accept it. So. Um, I think it's a really important part of, of our music industry and definitely something we should, should be exploring together. In regards to Lyric Find, I think um, a lot of publishers may not, I don't know, see the value in us because you think you, you don't have your lyrics, but we actually have a content team that works all day and listens and transcribes the lyrics. So even if you don't have them at all, like you can still work with us and we can still display them and you can still monetize them. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say about it in terms of Lyric Find. Good stuff. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, like Chantal, I actually spent some time in the UK about four or five years ago and I uh, took part in a, what was a copyright review that was sort of initiated by the, uh, the government there at the time. And the kind of main conclusion that was drawn up at the end was about how important education was in this area. And so there's something called the Copyright Hub that they've set up yeah. over there in the UK. Yeah. Uh, and it's doing really well. And it's interesting how they found that that was kind of a key element that was missing. Yeah, so I actually, um, this is a digital catapult. And uh, I was kind of involved in some of the parts when I was at QSongs with that. And they had this really great explainer video, like two, three minute video, which, which explained music licensing. And I remember watching it being like, this is great. Like it just, it's just so simple. It's literally music licensing for dummies. Anyone can understand it. And so what we did was we just basically created our own version for our click and clear um, market. And we've created this short three minute video that just explains music licensing 
relevant to our end users and everyone who watches it mm. is like thank you so much i now feel like i understand it and yeah. it you know a lot better I, th I think that's a huge thing i think so many people forget about when you first encountered music licensing yeah. how complex it is yeah or maybe the, some people the minefield i mean yeah. when our when the cheerleading industry got sued um the, the governing body released a statement saying you're not allowed to use commercial music unless it's licensed, but you're allowed to use cover music, which completely disregards the publishing rights, okay? And they've all been running around like headless chickens, wondering what the hell they're supposed to be doing in terms of licensing music. Some of them are just like, I'm just going to continue using it illegally because there's nowhere, nowhere I can actually license it. And others uh, are trying to find ways to, to get that music license and are trying to understand it. And we've, we've run quite a few successful webinars already and we're starting to see in the forums and Facebook groups that, that, that they're really understanding that they have <coughs> to do it and accepting that as a fact. Good stuff. So, uh, so the next question that I'd like to ask you guys, seeing as we're here in a, a room full of uh, music publishers, but most everybody on the panel here is, is representing a business or a service. What would you guys do if you were in their shoes? Let's switch the tables a little bit. What would you do in their shoes over the next sort of 12 to 24 months? What would you be focused on? You know, I, I would like to, uh, I come from another industry and you know, I, I know how hard the independent, all the publishers work really hard and when I, you know, read about, or the more that I understand about um, these unbelievably low percentage administration deals that the uh, independent publishers uh, do, uh, it, it freaks me out because <clears throat> I can't figure out how, you know, the, the strain that it must put on independent publishers uh, to make money with all like the amazing services they provide to their writers. So, um, you know, I, I would like to see the independent music publishers be able to charge their writers more money uh, for the services they provide, um, because I, you know, I, I worry about uh, the stress on the publishers, and you know, for for Traysona, I, I mean, this is it's you know, we service most publishers for some segment of the market or the other. Um, so when a writer goes from publisher A to publisher B, you know, like we might like publisher A more than publisher B, but we're still going to license um, the title and, and Traysona will still make their commission off of the sale. But we know how hard and how much effort, you know, because we see it every day and we see how sort of under siege a lot of the independent publishers are. So. I would just like to see uh, independent publishers, all, all publishers, recognized for you know, how much work they put into making the music popular because if you're not popularizing the music and making the music popular, then no one is going to come to license it. So you know, the, the more effort that can be put in and the more that the independent publishing community can thrive, and the publishing community in general, the better off Traysona is going to be, the more demand there's going to be for the music that we get to license. I think we're in a really interesting and exciting space now in the music industry. We're starting to see revenues climb up again and with the likes of Spotify kind of coming in and helping monetize in the streaming space. And we've got loads of new different revenue streams coming out and everyone here on this panel has something else that they're doing. And I think as a publisher, you know, you can only reach what you can with who you have in your company, whether it's just you on your own or it's a small group of people or 10, 15 people, you've only got the people that you can reach out to in your network. And you're not going to be able to find those hard to reach spaces necessarily on your own or deal with those kind of approval requests on a case by case basis. And I, th I think as a publisher in kind of today's world, it's really about um, collaborating with various different companies that make sense for your music and make sense for your kind of ethos and, and the kind of business mindset. And so I think it's, it's really about working with others and finding new companies you could be working with and collaborating with to find those new revenue streams that, that could be uh, really beneficial for you.
Yes, but also not dropping the ball. And I know as an, a publisher myself, I've dropped the ball with some companies and failed to follow the revenue income. And the, 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 it's very tedious reading tiny lines <laughs> of income and zeros. And I, you know, I've been getting statements for years like that. And my eyes are bad. So as tedious as it is, take your loop and watch the revenue, the streaming income. Just watch it over the next year. And then also opt into your HFA agreements. <laughs> you just have to because they're going to, HFA is going to help you out. They, they help me out. I, a lot of it I just, I really need to leave it in their hands. They, they, they strike great deals with companies. Do it on your own if you, if you want to. Um, HFA will support you in a lot of their agreements too. Cool. Anyone else? I, w I would just add um, operational addressability. Um, one of the things that we benefited from, I think, was the uh, infrastructure that labels put into place to address the streaming market, real time reporting and stuff like that. And um, publishers have been slow to, for a variety of reasons, uh, figure out how to standardize that stuff. And for a business like ours, which requires an affirmative license from you guys, it's really critical that at some point there's a way that we can see exactly where stuff stands in real time. I know that's like a, a giant wish just because it's it's difficult and and um, but hopefully that'll emerge in, in the wake of the modernization act and something you guys can just opt into as opposed to having to build it yourselves one thing I wanted to add was um, <clears throat> if you if the publishers if I was a publisher I would stay on top of keeping my catalog updated with us because especially for lyrics um, the usage is very early on in the release and so if we don't know that you are a part of this, that you are claiming the song, then we can't make the lyrics available. And so you're missing out on that usage, discoverability, and all of that, so. Yeah, making sure the metadata is all correct because you often get, you know, the splits aren't necessarily mm. right, publishers <laughs> have changed hands, like you need to constantly keep that updated um, so that those platforms or services that you work with are able to pay you. <laughs> Oh yeah, figure out splits before you release music. <laughs> yeah, that would be, that would help. <laughs> that would be good. I don't I don't know if the new CSAC agent Harry Fox agency is going to function in that capacity of um, an ISWC code or anything like that. I, I don't know much about that, but that would be ideal if there would be, you know, if every if there were a, a common works registration number for everything and everything were straight across the board, around the whole world. It would make it very easy, but I don't, that's ideal. All right, I'm getting the sign that we have about 10, 15 minutes left. So we're gonna open it up to the floor. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, there's some microphones right there uh, in the middle, so don't be shy. Uh, and in the meantime, while, while we wait for the brave soul to come up and ask some questions, any, any final closing thoughts from, uh, from the panelists? Anything, that, any requests that you'd like to make to uh, all the publishers in the room? I'm going to say be open-minded. Um, quite often, you know, we've been working, you've been working in the industry for a long time, and then these new kind of services and platforms come in and start to shake things up, and you're like, oh, no, that's not the way we used to do things. And, and really, like, if we're supposed to evolve as an industry, we need to be open-minded and, and, and be open to, to new ideas and new ways of making money, because at the end of the day, you know, we really did take a hit there. Um, with, the, with the revenues going down and, and it's kind of like slowly starting to creep back up but that, and that's kind of a lot to do with kind of innovation and um, those kind of people coming up and creating those new ideas. So that's really, that's kind of my request for me. I agree. Good stuff. Alrighty, have we got any, uh, any questions for the panelists? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think especially for Clipping and Clear and then the Lyric, um, licensing, what kind of um, pushback are you seeing from, um, well, I guess especially in Click and Clear, the licensees, so the gymnastics and dance industries, and is it mostly due to miseducation, like you were saying, or are they now, you know, kind of squawking a little bit because someone's saying, now we're going to hold you accountable to this, or are they grateful even because, you know, now they're not going to get sued, or is it kind of a combination of all that? It's kind of a combination. Um, it's, 
the kind of pushback you get, well, firstly, it was the, the statement that was released by the governing body that said you're allowed to use cover music and completely disregard publishing rights. So we've had to go back and basically re-educate everyone. And of course, we're having to make sure that we're coming in as a really credible company. And you know, they'll see us as, well, you know, you're just some, some company who's, who's founded by a cheerleader and, and knows music licensing, but you're the only voice who's talking about it because you're the only company who's doing it. So how can we trust what you say? Um, and so we're, we're very much working with the music industry to make sure that you know, they're aware it's not just us, it's this, this information is coming from the music industry. Um, and, and then on the other side of it, you know, a lot of those teams are really like, happy that we are able to provide them with music that is fully licensable so that they don't get sued because a lot of them are really, <coughs> really scared. You know? um, the lawsuit was quite a big deal and it really shook things up. And, um, and, and so, yeah, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of a bit of both, and our kind of main focus to combat it is to educate and then just p to provide a service which is really easy, affordable, and accessible. For, li for Lyric Find, um, we usually get pushback from publishers wanting to block particular songs, and we can do that. We can go on track-by-track -track basis, so um, there's no issues there if there's particular artists or songs that you don't want to license for any particular reason. I don't know why you will, but yeah. <laughs> Mark, were you gonna add something? Or All right. uh, any other questions for the panelists? No? So this one for yeah. Paul, I go. kind of don't understand exactly what kind of license you're using for, like what do people see when they're on the screen? Yes, excellent question. <laughs> um, <sighs> As far as we can tell, there really hasn't been an attempt to do these kinds of licenses in the way we're doing them. I know that's like great to hear, but um, it's traditionally, it would be considered a sink as far as I'm concerned. It would be something that would need to be cleared in advance on an approval basis. And so the business can't work that way. So uh, what we're asking our partners to do is pool for us masters and compositions that are approved to go in, we then sort of knit that together and build the library. So it's it's a blanket deal that's based on an expressed rate, like a sync deal, it's a MFN, label and publishing side. Um, all of the stuff expresses behind a paywall. Um, when you're on, when you're taking the ride, you are hearing a stereo mix that is music playing with the instructor voice baked in. There's very little, um, uh, user agency over the relative levels. There's really no way to like hijack the music out or pull it out. Um, it's generally just cr cross-faded um, based on like a, a setting that the instructor chooses, a couple seconds. And it's wall to wall. It's a, if it's a 20 minute class, it's 20 minutes of music. Um, so that's the type, I, I don't, I, you know, blanket sync, I don't know what you'd call it. It's, uh, it's sort of an oxymoron. I don't know if that was helpful. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know what you call it. We can come up with a name today. <laughs> All right. Uh, any more questions? Go in once, go in twice. All righty, I think we'll call it a day then. So I'd like to uh, join me if you'd like to thank, put your hands together and thank our esteemed panelists. You can catch us up here after the call. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you at the uh, cocktail party.